I say a lot, production is problems. Like no one show, who's in production shows up to work and things like, oh, gee, I hope there's no problems today. Welcome to Uplift and Elevate. This is our Uplift Her guest podcast series that shares the courageous journeys of individuals getting an honest look into their life, their struggles, successes, and how they broke down barriers to get where they are today. We are Amy and Christina and believe honest conversations can help give you the elevation and empowerment to write your own success story. My next guest is a creative executive who has worked across independent and studio productions in animation, live action, visual effects, and virtual production. She is a businesswoman and founder in her own right. I've had the privilege of working with her and always admired her personal mission around representation and authenticity when leading people and teams. She is Katie Hooten. Uh, so if we kind of start at the beginning, um, I'd love you to kind of share some of like early context in terms of what maybe has shaped who you are today. Sure. Thanks. Well, I grew up in the Midwest in the United States, uh, in Ohio and Indiana, and my parents were educators and um, I grew up running around the neighborhood with my two older brothers with a super eight millimeter camera. (laughs) And Uh we would, we saved our money to get the camera and then we saved our money to buy film. And then when we would do, uh, we would shoot little things around the neighborhood. We would have to put it in the mailbox and wait two weeks to get the film back. And that was a major focus. We just loved movies. We loved Mm -hmm. Uh, creating, um, we would. I I always had the dream to work in the entertainment business. I didn't know how to do it, and when we were young, my mom would take us to the library to get books on filmmaking, and um, we didn't know anybody that worked in entertainment. It just seemed like a very far fetched idea. Um, but over the years, our projects that started out being kind of silly and uh, just a way to kill time as kids, you know, became more refined and, um, we got more serious about it. And I think, uh, I differentiated more from my brothers where things that I thought were common, uh, skills, I started to see how they might be, um, special skills that I had in terms of organizing and um, being able to take a big mess of creative idea and put it into categories and, and get resources like people who could be invested Mm -hmm. in helping us and locations to shoot things. And uh, I didn't realize at the time, like that was early producing and, um, and it was a skill. It was a special skill. Not everybody could do. And so that, you know, beyond college, I was a theater major in college. And I did not think that working in entertainment was really very practical. So I had a teaching emphasis. Um, I did student teaching in high school and thought maybe I'd be a theater professor or theater teacher or something. You trying to blend the two. Is that what you like? <laughs> thinking that I've, there's, there must be a way that I can stay close to this world that I seem to love, but also do something that was maybe going to have more of a conventional kind of career. Yeah, exactly. I just couldn't wrap my head around it. And I think it's because I didn't have very many examples of what it looked like to take a leap into a field that seemed very mysterious and, um, and kind of out of reach. I moved to LA, um, with a lot of supportive friends and my husband and, um, I already had a master's degree in education (laughs) and I was working the most entry level jobs and feeling like, Oh my gosh, I've got a master's degree. I'm sitting in a taco bell, turning off air conditioning (laughs) during a shoot in the back alley, you know, whatever I was hired to do as a production assistant or whatever, it's a little bit tough, but, um, that really started a climb and, um, an eye opening series of experiences the the idea of like kind of doing production though and like you said going back to 
your early years of like running around with a camera and like kind of when did you realize that could be a job? Oh, it took a really long time. Mm -hmm. I didn't think that it was a job at all. And uh, I think it was really towards the the late part of college for me. Um, I just did not know how to take the leap. And I think that's what's so cool about the efforts that you're making and the conversations that you can have here where um, – it's a key piece, I think, in diversity and inclusion conversations where if the example's not there, it's so hard to visualize it. It's so hard to find the bridge um, where really it's just a step at a time. It's taking every opportunity that's there and having a vision for what happens just beyond that opportunity. I think that's a little bit easier to take in than the huge career leap of where do I want my career to go? ultimately like I for me having that too far out was almost too much of a stretch um I just was constantly getting exposed to new things and you know especially in a in an industry like this one where it's a massive team sport there's so many specialties under that umbrella of entertainment or the umbrella of film that um some aspects of it there's no way for a person to know all the possibilities that exist that could align with your personal skills or interests until you really get in there and you start to yeah. see how you could specialize and and contribute yeah i mean i've definitely admire those people that seem to know that's the thing that i want to do i think <laughs> yeah that they're actually right. probably few and far between, but they, they do exist. Some people just will go, that's ultimately where I where I want to be. Yeah, um, I would feel so envious about like yeah. someone in elementary school that would just tell me I'm going to be a doctor and it yeah. takes this many years and I'll go to these schools. And, the, and it just felt like, yeah. oh my gosh, that must be so great to know what your path is, where my path has been sort of like loop-de-loo yeah. all around. The exposure of just understanding the variety that is even available, I think, is something that, and like you said, I think we're very similar in the conversations that we've had. It's like one step at a time is also fine. Like it's you don't have to know where you're at. I had no idea around this sort of industry until I was in it. Um, right. And that happened to probably be more by chance than anything. Um, but knowing that, career development and progression and everything isn't about her knowing your North Star like all the time. It's about kind of taking steps forward and kind of taking opportunities as they come as well. Right. And then realizing the progression of your own skills. There are things that are in me that are, um, I think, really powerful skills that I used to think were so commonplace. Um, and which ones? it's all uh, what say that again that which ones oh well something that comes to mind is that thing I mentioned where you know kind of enjoying the artistic mess that I grew mm. up in and figuring out how to order things to figure out like oh what are the dependencies here how do we break this down into manageable bites of this massive thing we want to do um I used to think that just was like a regular mindset that people have. And then over time realized, oh, no, not everybody can do that, especially artistic people might have a very difficult time uh, breaking down their vision. Or um, I have in recent years figured out um, I, I would perhaps not have considered myself to be a technical person, but I find myself in many technical conversations and, and meetings and being able to hold my own and understand um, what's happening because I know how to ask questions. And, mm. and I used to think like, well, asking questions, is that really a specialty? But it's kind of foundational yeah. for being a producer or being uh, an executive or a leader of any kind is being able to pinpoint where the question marks are, bring them to light, ask the questions, have the experts that are weighing in, and then be able to sort of distill the information into a plan that's achievable. Um, I, I didn't used to think that was a skill, but with exposure to all kinds of brilliant artistic people, 
uh, I started to realize, oh, I have a part to play in this. I have mm -hmm. a, a necessary skill that can um, just bring life into this production. Yeah. And how, um, you know, because you said, like, I didn't realize that some of those skills were, like, unique and really valuable. Has feedback played, like, a big part in that? Has it been important to kind of get information from others to understand that actually that that is something that is quite special and something yeah. that you do want to develop as well I just wonder how from yourself not knowing how important that is as a skill set and then discovering actually this is something I bring value to that is a really good comment I think so yeah and I I also as I was thinking about this conversation we were going to have I was thinking about mentorship and how much for like my whole career, I always wanted that mentor that was going to sort of link arms with me mm -hmm. and show me the ropes and take me on the ride with them. And I've seen other people where that's happened and it's super cool. Um, and I've had, I've had different people give me opportunities, but I haven't really had that, that mentor that's just hung with me for the ride. Um, and I, I found myself looking around like, oh, how do I get, you know, how do you find one? How do you, how do you be in that relationship with someone who's strides ahead? But then I think where I kind of ended up is peer mentorship is really strong. It's such a powerful connection that can happen with people who are shoulder to shoulder with you in work settings or in personal settings. And I have a lot of peers that have been mentors to mm. me, even in um, just sort of as allies or, you know, doing a, a very difficult project together and being able to look across at a, at a work friend and say, I really like how you did that. And you do that very different than what my instinct would have been like, yeah. talk, talk to me about that. And sort of the recap that can happen with, um, with a really strong like work buddy. Um, that's been super valuable. And I think that's helped me refine my skills as well to look at those examples. And I think that's, it seems like that's what you're doing here with your group as well. One thing that I don't know if we're always that good at is kind of going, I need to build this board of people that I can go to because I can't, there, there's never going to be one specialist that can give me everything. <laughs> Right. They're going to be very rare. So how can I build up a collection of people that I can go to and they can also come to me um, yeah. and we can go through different scenarios or build up different things and, and like kind of have this group of people effectively like organizations do. They have right. they never have one person just doing everything. You have like these collection of people that can that bring different different traits and different specialities to the to the table kind of I think it's about doing the same thing with your own career yeah yeah and then how surprising it is when I'll have people come to me and I'll be like oh me I'm I'm the mentor <laughs> okay <laughs> but um over time it's it's nice to be able to encourage and to and to share and to give opportunity and tell somebody else like, Hey, you're really good at that. Mm -hmm. Like you should lean into that. If you enjoy it, you're really good. Listening to you talk about production and th then thinking about my own career and space that I've been in um, from a people HR perspective, it's so similar. I, I say a lot. Production is problems. Like no one show who's in production shows up to work and things like, oh, gee, I hope there's no problems today. Because that's yeah. all it is. It's straight problems from yeah. the beginning of the production all the way to then. Uh, and by problems, I mean like it's just like a huge puzzle to figure out every day. Things don't go according to plan. You know, your quotas drop. You got to regain ground. Whatever it is, the the director changes their mind about a dozen things, and. I think being able to weather some of that really tough uh, journey stuff in a production and then think about like, well, what, do, what part do I own in things that didn't go optimal? You know, how can I change that? How can I become a better leader? What did I learn? I mean, it's an, it's an important reflection and not everybody wants to do it. Um, you 
you kind of have to be self-affirming and, and reflective and figure things out um, yeah. because it's not you're not going to get that from anywhere else. I love that word you use, self-affirming, because I say a lot with my team here, we're all making quiet decisions mm -hmm. every day that lead to our success or our communal success or, or someone else's. And there's no way you can possibly do that with an audience. I, yeah. And I think that is maturity that builds over time as a leader is you realize I'm making these quiet decisions moment by moment that is creating something greater. And to be able to recognize that and sort of have the, the inner joy and celebration of doing those things. I also think it's important to let other people know when you're when you're killing it, yeah. <laughs> it can't, it can't all be, it can't all be behind the scenes, but, yeah. um, but it is, I think an important part of satisfaction to have that, um, have that personal affirmation. So to that point then, how do you celebrate successes and ensure you kind of get the recognition that you deserve? Oh man, I celebrate everything. <laughs> I'm an Good. over celebrator. Yes. <laughs> celebrate the smallest things. Um, I have uh, some partners in my company that I do on the side, Hardy Howl, and we mm. create content. And I, all, they already know, like any new draft that I read of theirs, I'm the worst at giving notes because I have to spend like a day being like, yay, you did it. I can't believe you, we got it, you know, like I'll over celebrate and then I have to like read it again or come back to it and be like, okay, and now I'm going to give notes because it's just so exciting to, uh, you know, the accomplishment of anything new. Um, but I think in my role at MPC, we have a weekly meeting that has become so vital and it is, we solve no problems in that meeting. It is a studio update call. We developed it during COVID to keep together and to keep our company culture thriving. And it's a silly, silly call. It's a half an hour. I tried to quit doing it. I tried to dial it back to like once a month and people were like, no, no, no we, need it. we need it. So we celebrate, you know, every department, what's going on in that department. We play a game, we give out prizes and um, call attention to like some really great stuff. Even if it's small, it's kind of funny how small some things are that we want to celebrate. And for myself, any audience I get with someone I'm reporting into or a group I'm reporting into, I'm very well prepared. And I will just say that as a, as a recommendation for anyone, um, when you get someone's ear and it's limited time, be super organized and be ready to, to toot your horn of what you've done. Tell the story. You know, no one's going to tell the story better than you of what you've done or what your team has done. But if you're not prepared to do it, um, it can be a little scattered and it's not as focused to, to um, give them the news of the wins of the week or the wins of the month or whatever it's been. So I think um, when you have the audience, don't squander it, like make the most of that. Uh, and, and there are usually times where you can just come in with a, a few strong bullet points. Um, I think that's important. Yeah. Well, um, is there anything that you do to prepare for that? Yeah, I script a lot. Uh, I yeah. script a lot of things. I mean, that's the other thing that's been so crazy about COVID is we're so used to Zoom calls and um, I really use, um, I use a lot of notes. Uh, and I'm ready with those notes. I save them week to week and just build on them. I'm always keeping kind of a running list of things. And um, if someone starts talking, I start writing, like in my notepad I have right here. <laughs> I just, um, I'm really visual and it helps me. Um, but I would say keeping notes when you're ready to meet with someone, be well prepared. And uh, yeah, I do script. I do try to find those word sets that mm -hmm. I think are going to be most impactful for someone to remember the information I want them to have as a takeaway. The right yeah. word set can really stay with people. Navigating to that point of having a seat at the table, um, particularly in an industry um, that is quite male dominated, whether it is talking about kind of the, the 
company that you run independently or whether it's kind of your your role that you're you've referred to as well how have you kind of found that and gone about that I have yet to receive unsolicited invitations <laughs> what meaning <Yeah. laughs> um, I have had to ask I've had to ask and I've had to tell and I've had to say um, you know a few bosses ago I went to uh, that boss. And I said, I want to be on your executive team. Um, and that person said, uh, okay, I'm open to that. I don't know what you do. Why don't you do some research and come back and pitch something to me? So I spent a couple of months researching where I thought the gaps were and where I thought I could help. And I went back and, and pitched a role and was, was granted that role. And so I think that's a, a short example, but it, I've had so many examples in my career where nobody was inviting me. Mm-hmm. And I, in my younger days, I think I would be frustrated and I would think like, well, I'm really, I've really got a lot to offer. I'm really smart. Why, you know, why not? I should be in that meeting. And, but quietly stewing about something doesn't, it, it doesn't get you to the goal. I mean, people just want ease and evidence um, that you can be helpful. And so sharing perspective on something, being in a big group meeting, and then afterwards following up with the person that presented and saying like, here are some things I've been thinking about, or I really like how you put this and that together. Here's, here's a perspective from where I'm coming from, like getting engaged and involved and then asking, asking to lead an initiative on something, asking to be invited into a meeting, asking to be a part of an executive team. I think... I haven't had a ton of examples of that. And so it has felt very awkward to me because I, you know, I feel sometimes, oh, do I have the right? Do I have the right to do this? But like, of course, like there aren't necessarily rules on that. And people want to know that you have a strong point of view, that you have an interest, um, that you want to help solve the issues of the day. So I think asking Asking for placement sometimes is the best thing you can do. No, I love that. Like, it's almost nobody's going to champion you, so you kind of have to be your own champion and you have yeah. to be brave enough. And maybe it's not always done in the same way. Some people might be help, like comfortable speaking out in the middle of group meetings and those things, right. but not everybody is. So that kind of thing of, like, follow-up afterwards. Like, yeah. send something, like, See if you can give them something that is of value to them so that you kind of get seen and heard like, and not not waiting for it to happen as well because I think if you wait. Yeah. I, I was recently in a meeting where I was, th- I was listening to a certain issue that was being discussed and I felt kind of new to the group that was discussing it. It was a global group and I kept thinking oh gosh this thing I'm thinking of is so obvious it's so obvious that they must have discussed it when I wasn't Mm. here before because it's glaring and um and it wasn't coming up the issue that I was thinking and so I ended up saying it and thinking you know almost apologetically forgive me if you've already discussed this but you know disclaimer disclaimer and it ended up like everybody there was thankful that it was stated and it turned into a richer conversation because of that. And I think that instinct, and again, like I continue to need to build my confidence to have my voice heard in a room and, and the invitation's not always there. So nobody's going to want that or should want it for you more than you want it for yourself. Like, Mm. so it's finding ways to continue to contribute and, um, challenge make yourself available it's important yeah um and that point that you kind of said about not having people to look up to um or not having people that have maybe from a representation standpoint um but you are a mother and a businesswoman in an industry that that isn't necessarily easy um how have you found navigating all of that I think it's changed over time. Uh, one really positive thing about the younger set of mm-hmm. uh, people in the workforce, millennials, that get a lot of bad jokes about them and stuff. 
I think one positive thing is millennials care about work-life balance and are insist upon it. Like I've seen young people, like if they got plans on a Friday, they're going to, they'd quit their job over missing their plans, you know, which is ridiculous and really should, you know, definitely need some mentorship there in terms of how one carries oneself in a professional setting. But uh, I think that's brought a wave of insistence about balance and about having a life outside of work that's really important. And I know you and I have talked before in my early days, I wouldn't even have a picture up of my kids at my Mm -hmm. desk because I didn't want people to think that I lacked focus or I lacked, um, you know, any devotion to the tasks at hand. And, um, man, I just have so many examples where it was obviously frowned upon if you indicate that you have anything going on outside Mm -hmm. of work, but really if we could allow people to be holistic in their approach to challenges, uh, I, I say to my team quite a bit, like, please don't leave the best parts of yourself at home. Please feel the safety to bring your best here because we only benefit from that. But I do think there's a protective nature that many of us have because uh, we want we, we don't want to be taken advantage of, or we want to be respected or we, you know, there's a lot of protective coding, um, a lot of reason for it. But in the end, like, I think over time I've leaned into just being my whole self. Like mm-hmm. I love to have a good time. I love to laugh and being able to bring a sense of humor into work is super important to me. And if I leave that at home, I'm like a shell of myself at, you know, at work on the job. So little things like that. Um, Sometimes I've had my daughter come in to the studio and do her homework, like out in the kitchen, out in the courtyard, because she wants to be here. And also I want other people to know, uh, yeah, we we have families, we have responsibilities, and this is why we give ourselves into our work so much. We want to be successful. And part of that is for our families. And there are times when I've had to miss work and have someone do coverage for me in meetings. And I said recently to a colleague, please tell them I'm, I'm at my kid's school conference and that's why I'm not here. I want them to know why I'm not here because it gives them permission to do the same. So I think those are the kind of things we have to do to normalize um, the balancing act. And most people, if they feel happy and respected and satisfied, they're going to give their all. Are there any career practices that you do or information that you think has helped you the most? I really believe in setting aside like rituals for yourself and only you will know what you need to make your day run well. And Mm -hmm. we've all had those days when we're like, oh, we're chasing our asses and like everything's off kilter and you're behind from the moment you're feet hit the floor out of your bed in the morning. But in the ideal, um, and I talk about this with my team, I talk about it with my daughter. It's like, take a step back, because you know, what it looks like to end your day well, what are those rituals you put in place that allow you to exhale, and leave the day and bring in calm, and get ready to to have rest. And then how do you set yourself up? How do you start your day in a way that just gives you that little bit of care? Like for me, I'm a total slow poke in the morning. And (laughs) I know if I get up like 15 or 20 minutes early, because I like to be slow, then that is, that's sort of like this act of self care to just like be slow. Well, you know, or something that I do to really care for myself is most days before I leave my office, I will review and make the list of what is happening the next day or even put together my bullet points or even script my first couple meetings as far as the itinerary of that meeting. And to me, that is a very calming experience Mm -hmm. because I don't let it rattle around in my brain in an anxious way of what's coming, what's coming, you know? Um, So the more prep I can do for myself, the more... I am kind of emotionally available for people that need it. Um, 
And that's something I try to do as much as possible. So that's a big one is build in time to be well prepared Mm. Um, because things are going to go sideways and there's no way you can prepare for half the stuff's going to be thrown at you. So if you can prepare for the knowns, then when the unknowns come and, you know, crash in on you, you're more available to deal with those things. So that's that's a big one for me. Give yourself time to to switch off in whatever way possible. I think like you said that that ritual yeah. of writing everything allows you to put it in a box over there and do yeah. something else and recharge. Yeah. Yeah, that's a big one for me. Um I I also um, think another thing that's just like a recommendation for mindset is I talked about resources and and information being one of our key resources Mm. that we all have to figure out what to do with. And everything's information, everything. Um, Even how people set up their meetings, how they run their meetings, meeting with a client, if they want to small talk about something specific, um, if they, you know, share personal information, even their mannerisms. I, I mean, we're just inundated with lots and lots of information that can be helpful to be better communicators. I also think information can help us take things less personally and not make it about us, but make it about what is being laid before me right now that I can do something with. Um, And that has helped me, I think, as a leader to try to take in as much as I can, not as good or bad, not as positive or negative, but this is the information I have. And now what do we do with it? Yeah. And I suppose then it's that point about not interpreting everything or something as as personal. I think going back to what you were kind of saying about confident, if you, confidence, if you see it as, as information and you have a choice to either act or not act or do something with that piece of information, it becomes a bit more empowering because you're making the decision over whether you do something with it or not. Yeah. And then feeling the freedom to like, let's ask more questions. Mm. And sometimes I've been in a room where I'm looking side to side and I'm thinking, I'm totally confused with what was just shared. Is anybody else totally confused? (laughs) And just having to take the moment to say, okay, let's ask some more questions because if I'm experiencing this, maybe I'm really off today and it's just me, but chances are it's probably not just me. Chances are we've got some gaps to fill in right now of information or something wasn't clarified and like ask more questions as as many more as you need to. There's definitely something about that, isn't it? About like fear of asking questions, but actually if you come from a perspective, is it going to help everybody else? in the room then it does it becomes maybe less intimidating we're not necessarily asking only for ourselves but we realize that we're asking for everybody as well maybe that's a bit of an empowering thing yeah yeah summarizing the goals i mean Mm -hmm. so so many times i'm in meetings where i'm like let's do a summary what did we just hear (laughs) you know just help with the help the group focus yeah Summary of what like what have we decided and what needs yeah. to happen. I think is yeah. Already, yeah. Yeah. Next steps. That I say the word next steps probably <laughs> two dozen times a day. Okay, next steps. <laughs> what is it that you think senior leaders struggle to rethink? Ooh. Given that you've been in like millions of scenarios and meetings and like you said goals and yeah I think this is a message for myself as much as anyone that change is possible Mm. I think we get really worn down with the same old thing sometimes the same problems and um, barriers uh, that are all too familiar and it takes energy to remain optimistic and I really think Optimism plays a key role in being an effective leader. Mm. Hope plays a key role and um, not losing that commitment to um, to trying to dig from that well of like energy, positivity, to uh, roll something around, be willing to revisit 
old ideas, old mm-hmm. challenges in a new way. But, you know, change can happen. I think um, timing is key. People who come into the circle of trying to make those changes are key. And I know that's something that I do struggle with is um, trying to be a positive person. And sometimes it gets a little bit hard to come up against um, similar barriers time and time again. So that's something like I personally think I need to continue to rethink is how to remain positive uh, in in a way that can make effective change. And keeping along the lines of positivity and optimism, what's next for Katie? Ooh, thank you for asking. Um, I always keep a creative wheel turning in whatever formal role I might be in uh, day to day. I am. Um, developing a couple of creative projects with my partners and putting together independent financing for those things. So that's sort of edges of the day, nights and weekends sort of effort. Um, And then in my work um, currently, I never thought I'd be in visual effects. It was something new that, that grew over time and my knowledge of it has grown over time. And I think there's sort of a language to visual effects there's a lot of changes happening. Um, visual effects is such a hefty component to filmmaking. Mm-hmm. So I think um, I want to continue to get as close to the creative work as I can, because I feel like I have a lot to offer in that realm in terms of um, helping to plan and helping to impact story. That's always been a big part of the dream. So my eyes are on the future. I. I want to work till I'm a wrinkled old lady, (laughs) hunched over drinking my coffee. Um, No, I just, I find so much joy in, um, in work and in challenge. And so I plan to just continue to evolve over time and, and find new ways to make impact. I think I've had to learn how to, go after things that I really want for myself. Um, It's hard for me to not use the word we, uh, because I'm always seeing myself as an extension of my family or, you know, people I care for in life. And there's something exciting too, to cut an individual path, something very fulfilling. And so I guess that's the challenge for me is to continue to, um, feel empowered to cut that path for myself, even as someone that that is a caregiver for others. Yeah. And I think, like you said, throughout your whole story, like taking each step as it comes, but recognising the the value that, that you bring. And I think one of the difficulties that I've always found within this kind of industry or the creative industry overall is that that competitive nature can Mm -hmm. sometimes force people apart um you don't feel like you can connect or or share things or build your own career board or whatever it is and I think as as women who are still like kind of the minority that I mean that was one of the main reasons we've started like uplift her because I think there is power in story the more that we hear other people kind of share but there's power in connection as well. Um, mm-hmm. and it's not necessarily about getting your next job, but it is about kind of feeling kind of confident and capable and, and all of those things like does amazing things, I think, in your career. So I yeah. hugely appreciate you sharing. Um, I've loved, My speaking, pleasure. loved finding out more about you and all <laughs> the facets that are that is Katie Hooten. Um, and I'm excited to kind of see especially where your like projects go as well thank you oh I I'm so appreciative for the time and I think the more that we share our stories it can be inspirational to each other so thanks for the little bit that you've shared yourself and for creating this platform for women to find each other and to make uh really meaningful relationships and to be helpers to each other Thank you for listening to Uplift and Elevate. This episode was with Katie Hooton. 
Our goal at Uplift Her is to develop effective and lasting change by focusing on building a strong community, providing essential career resources and effective mentoring programmes. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast, follow us on Instagram and reach out if you're interested in getting involved and learning more about our work.